Hello and welcome back to Pharmacist Diaries. I'm really excited to bring this episode to you with Sandeep Gasai, who is the current Principal Medicines Management Specialist at a company called Daedalus. For those of you who don't know what this company does or what their specialist areas are, you'll find out all about that in this week's episode. Sandy is also um, a very specialized pharmacist with multiple years of experience. He has had the opportunity to work in Qatar, which will be really exciting to hear about. And of course, I'll be sharing similar tips and tricks of traveling abroad and working in different places. He's also a father of two young children, similar to myself. So we have a lot of similarities and a lot of enjoyable conversation. So I hope you guys enjoy the episode. So welcome to Pharmacist Diaries, Sandy. Thank you so much. So great to be here and thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. No, I'm absolutely delighted. I mean, when we kind of discovered each other through um, LinkedIn, there were a lot of similarities from our career journeys, um, which makes it really interesting to have a conversation, but also an enjoyable aspect when you know that you've got maybe similar, you know, work experience or similar thought processes. Now we're parents, obviously our career journeys will be slightly different in terms of juggling our professional life with family life and also our values in terms of what our careers look like will have changed. So it's always nice to share that experience with other people. So um, yeah, a super warm welcome to the episode. And as always, I kickstart Pharmacist Diaries by finding out a little bit more about why you became a pharmacist. Absolutely. So, so, so my journey with pharmacy kind of started a really long time ago, to be honest, um, to the point where I was, I was probably about seven, eight years old when, when I kind of got introduced to pharmacy. Um, so my dad's a, a printer by background, and he actually does all of the printing work for Day-Lewis pharmacies um, and, and has been doing that for a number of years. Um, so his unit where he used to run his printing press from was on the same site that Day-Lewis had their, their warehouse. Um, and so as a young, uh, young boy kind of going in to, to help my dad out at work, really just kind of playing around in the warehouse. Um, I was exposed to um, all of the work that went into all of the back office of, of Day-Lewis and the pharmacy, um, you know, warehousing and, and, and procurement side of things that, that kind of went into that. Um, I'm not saying I did any kind of pharmacy work at that point in time, but just being exposed to that environment and seeing, you know, medicines being used and, 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 and distributed out to the various different stores kind of introduced me to, 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 to the world of pharmacy. And then I think, um, like like many people, um, as you kind of go through your school career, you you look at opportunities and career career choices which will be stable for you in the future. Um, and and pharmacy kind of seemed like a a, a familiar option to me, um, but at the same time also quite a safe option in terms of you know knowing that I'll always have a career at the end of the day as a pharmacist um, if I wanted to do that for the rest of my life. But I'd say I think at the at the point at, re- at which I reached A levels, I, um, I I really kind of found that my passion lay in business and my passion lay in in IT. Um, I studied sciences at school, um, but there was always something in the back of my mind that said, you know, I wanted to go into IT. I wanted to go into um, into business. Um, but that said, I kind of you know bit my lip and carried on with the whole kind of pharmacy journey and and eventually kind of you know got got into pharmacy school at uh, King's College um spent my four years there four four of the best years of my life um before then kind of moving into uh to to do my pre-registration year within hospital pharmacy um and it was really at that point in time where I really kind of started to look at different career paths within pharmacy. Um, I got a really good feel for how a large hospital runs and how a large hospital operates, um, particularly from a pharmacy perspective. Um, but there was always still something more out there for me in terms of, you know, is there more that a pharmacist could do or is there, is there more that a pharmacist could benefit from through the use of technology? Um, so at the end of my pre-reg year, I kind of, you know, um, decided it was the right time to be able to, to, to go and explore those other opportunities. Um, and at St. George's at the time, they were implementing a new electronic health record. Um, and I thought it would be a really good opportunity at the end of pre-reg just to go and do a bit of volunteer work and, and just to understand that side of things. I knew I enjoyed business, I knew I enjoyed IT and I knew I enjoyed healthcare. So it kind of just all married up quite nicely. 
Um, and so I, um, so yeah, I volunteered to do a bit of work in, in, in my own time, um, helping to configure the system and, and, and learn the ropes as to what that sort of project looks like and how it, how it operates. Um, and then ever since then, it's just kind of, kind of snowballed into kind of a career in digital health. Um, and I've, I've never really looked back since, to be honest. Hey guys, before we get into this week's episode, I really want to remind you about the discount code that I have for thenakedpharmacy.com. As my listeners or viewers of the podcast, you'll receive a 20% discount using the code PD20. Both myself, my husband and my children are using the products and we're absolutely loving them. I really want to advocate for this brand because number one, it's owned and created by a pharmacist, Kevin Levers. He has over 35 years of experience working in the industry of natural medicines and has created his own company and provided us with so many different products to support our needs. For me personally, I absolutely love their gut health products, the magnesium for my sleep and Safrasun Energy. Because as a mum of two very young children, working full time and juggling the day-to-day life that I have, I really need that extra support to keep me energized and going throughout the day. I also wanted to let you know that if you're not sure where to start with your supplement regime, Kevin has a team of multiple pharmacists that you can either contact by phone, email or on social media to get some support on where to get started. Check out their website, The Naked Farm pharmacy.com. Now let's get back to the episode. That's amazing. And I love that in terms of a story, because I'm always encouraging people who listen or watch this podcast is to truly understand what you enjoy, what, what lights you up, what are you passionate about? Also, what are you good at? You know, what do you do, whether it's in pharmacy school or as a pre-reg or in your spare time? where you go into that flow state where you have no idea what else is happening around you and understanding what it is that you're doing and then activating that specific skill or interest in terms of your job. So it's obviously really useful that you understood how much you enjoyed IT and digital um, health uh, as well as business. And even so early on in your pharmacy career, you found a way to kind of fit that in to the start of your journey. Because a lot of students, even now, the ones that I teach, third years, fourth years, still feel very, very confused as to where to start. I have this conversation with students all the time because, of course, with Pharmacist Diaries, it's a topic of conversation for me. It's the the conversation opener, you know, you know, how's university going? What have you been up to on the weekends and holidays? Um, Are you doing any work experience or internships? And once I open up that conversation, it always leads to what do you want to do with your life? Um, And most most students, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of the students that I teach will say that they're confused Um, or they they don't quite understand which pathway to go down or they haven't yet had the opportunity to really experience what that journey is going to look like. Um, or what it's like to work as that type of pharmacist on a day-to-day basis and whether or not they'd actually enjoy it. I think because there's a lot of clinical focus in most pharmacy curriculum that a lot of students end up going down a diploma route because it builds an amazing foundation in terms of knowledge and skill, which is completely true. I'm one of those. Um, And it did build an amazing foundation to start my career. And you find that a limited number of students truly know that, oh, okay, pediatrics is what I want to do or respiratory health or I love the idea of working in HIV, that they are a really small cohort. And it takes people several years to figure those things out. And what I'm trying to shift in terms of the mindset of people through this platform, through this podcast, through the content that I actually put out into the world, whether it's on social media or through my newsletters or in videos like this, is that, you know, think of the bigger picture and look at who you are, you know, what experience have you had through your childhood? What have you been exposed to by your family? Like, you're a great example of that is that you had seen what your dad was doing and the environment that he was in. And that's helped to navigate where kind of you are today. And you're fitting in a lot of your kind of not maybe not childhood passions, but your teenage passions and things that you enjoyed. And IT is a big one as well as and, and more so probably in males. Um that that, you know, they love 
computers, IT, um, games uh, being one of them as well. And, um, you know, you do lose track of time, don't you? Especially when you play games. Um, and, you know, that passion has then transfers into a workplace. And the joy within pharmacy for me is that there's so many options. And though they can be hard to navigate, once you figure out what it is that you enjoy, you can go all in. And, and that was kind of the start of your career journey, which is um, a beautiful story uh, to start this episode. Yeah, no, I, I I I completely resonate with everything that you said there. To be honest, I, I do a lot of work in my um in my spare time, kind of teaching um fourth year pharmacy students. Um, I do I do a bit of uh, do a few lectures and workshops um at De Montfort University and Keele University, where I'm trying to introduce the concept of digital health, and it's not something that many of those students will have ever experienced before or understood. And in a way, it's 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 probably something that they take for granted because healthcare is delivered so digitally now compared to when I qualified as a pharmacist or perhaps even when you qualified as a pharmacist. It's very, very different. Um, but what I often find is there isn't a um, an understanding that there's a career path out there for pharmacists to, to embark on within digital health. Um, and I think at the same time, I think there's also um, a, a lack of understanding of other career paths out there. There's There's, there's still very much a focus on the core, you know, community, hospital, industry, and now more so GP practice as, as kind of career paths for a pharmacist or traditional career paths for a pharmacist. And I imagine probably 90% of students will end up down one of those career paths. But the beautiful thing about the pharmacy degree is it's, it's probably one of the hardest degrees that you can do within, within the, the education space because it's such a well-rounded degree and it teaches you so much. Um, from a variety of different areas, whether it's chemistry all the way through to how to talk to people and communicate with people. It's a very, very well-rounded degree. Um, and, you know, as I've kind of gone through my career and I've, you know, spoken to people outside of the pharmacy world, they recognize that. They understand how difficult pharmacy is. They understand how well-rounded you are as an individual having qualified as a pharmacist. Um, and I think it's it's important that people take advantage of that um, that skill set that they've learned throughout their kind of career. Um, but I also agree with the fact that, you know, you, it's really important that you operate in that flow state, you operate in that, that, that space where you're doing something that you enjoy. Um, and I think the earlier you realize that in your career, um, the more chance you have to maximize, um, the enjoyment that you can get out of your career. Um, ideally we all want to be working in that environment where we're doing what we love rather than doing something for the money or doing it for another reason. So um, yeah, I feel really lucky and privileged to be able to be doing something that I really enjoy um, and, and, and have, it, ha, have been able to combine that with, with what I've gone to university for as well as what I've kind of, you know, grown up around as well. Yeah, I, it, it's quite, I think when I first qualified and worked in a hospital, and I've talked about this before, is that you experience pharmacy from the people you're surrounded by. And you've seen all these specialist pharmacists who you're working around in clinical areas, and they are role models for you. So as a young person who's, you know, 21, 22 years old, going into a new career pathway and a working life, in terms of the vision, you see what's in front of you, and you utilize that as your resource to build a career journey. And hospital allows you to do that in the clinical specialist areas. You've got the leadership side, you've got education and training, you've got IT, you've got digital health, you've got a lot. And because you're surrounded by so many colleagues and like other professionals who are in that space, it does expand your knowledge at quite a fast pace. So you get to understand more of what you like. And being in a band six rotational role, you, of course, every three months, m more than likely it's three month rotations, you're exploring different areas of expertise. You might be in a clinic setting versus medicines information versus a ward or dispensary or whatever it is that you get to do. And you start then figuring out more about yourself. <laughs> My problem as a band six pharmacist was I loved everything. <laughs> Major issue. I loved everything. I loved every clinical area. I loved every ward. I loved every specialist that I worked with. I was just happy being a pharmacist. And even in those three years of doing what I was doing, 
if I hadn't have moved to Dubai at that time, I would have gone into a, a band seven rotational job because I wasn't clear yet what I wanted to do. What I was clear about, which I know now, is that I loved educating um, patients. I was so passionate about delivering information to educate patients about their medications or side effects, interactions, whatever it was, and building rapport, having that kind of communication piece. And obviously, multiple years later, I've lived abroad, worked in leadership, done more hospital roles, founded pediatrics in my life, and then this podcast. And it's only now I'm in this very creative, innovative space, which has come through pure passion. I have figured out what it is that gives me flow state. And it is this podcast. It is having conversations with people like you. It is finding people to have these connections with and serving a community of students, trainees and pharmacists who are looking to excel in their careers, shift their mindset, think outside the box, you know, look at the different skills that they need and helping them on that journey. And I am in pure flow state just working on this. I could do it day and night and it doesn't feel like work. This is how I know I'm in my happy place is I don't actually feel like I'm doing a job actually for me now it is work. So I love that you found that so early on. That's so cool that you kind of knew from your training year onwards what it is that you kind of, you might not have known the exact pathway, but you had found your niche. And it's taken me like 11, 12, 13 years to figure that out. And that's cool. I've had so much fun experience along my journey. Along the way, right? There's no regrets. But when I meet people who know exactly like what space they want to be in, like that's so cool. And I love that. So tell me a little bit about um, your journey then from when you did that volunteer role. And then how did you transition in terms of your workspace? Yeah, so so that volunteer role really kind of set me up, to be honest. It gave me the foundations in that space to to be able to decide, yes, this is what I want to do. Um, I, I, I kind of went off and um, and got to experience some of the, some of what the industry has to offer um managed to go, get down to some of the the company's um head offices and see yeah, some of the technology that hadn't even been brought to the nhs yet or and in fact some of it still hasn't been brought to the nhs yet if i think back on it but um but it was just really really inspiring so i kind of made the decision yes this is the path i want to choose this is the path that i want to go down i then kind of took a bit of a risk, took a bit of a punt and um, applied for a band seven job when I hadn't even been ban- been a band six officially yet. So applied for a, a band seven job at Guys and St. Thomas's to implement EPMA, um, e-prescribing and medicines administration system. Um, there that was back in 2013. Um, I went to the interview, not really with very much hope that I would get it given, you know, I didn't have a long you know, history or background within the pharmacy world, I'd kind of pretty much just qualified as a pharmacist. Um, and I guess I, I kind of impressed in the interview and somehow I, man- I was managed to off- be offered the job. And um, I guess what really kind of set me apart from the other candidates and what, what I've spoken to my, my previous manager about now is the fact that when I interviewed, I didn't focus in on the digital. What I focused in on was the patient and the impact on the patient of implementing digital tools to support them. And I think that's a, a key principle that I've then subsequently held throughout my career in, in digital health. I've always come back to the patient as the key, um, I guess, the key stakeholder in, 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 in anything I do within the work that I do. So that project was, um, you know, I was there for around three years implementing electronic prescribing. And you've got to remember, this was at a time when hospitals were using paper drug charts, um, hugely unsafe paper drug charts, um, and had been using those for 50, 60, 70 years. So a massive change for the organization and particularly an organization as big as Guys and St. Thompson's, as you know too well as well. Um, it was a huge challenge, um, but I guess it was one of those roles which if you do well in, it sets you up for the rest of your career because you get exposed to so much. You've, you know, all of those challenges that come with instigating change and transformation in an organization that's, you know, so well embedded with its practices. Uh, was was hugely um, inspiring, hugely difficult, but you know helped me in my personal growth immensely. Um, 
And then I guess, you know, I got, you know, one of the things uh, as you speak about kind of operating in your flow state, um, one of the things that although I'm operating in my flow state in the field that I work in, one of the things I try have tried to do throughout my career is throw myself out of my comfort zone every now and then to, to really try and, you know, instigate that growth even further. Um, so what I did in 2016 was I looked at opportunities outside of the NHS um, and looked for an opportunity within the private sector, working for a, a digital healthcare supplier. Um, and at that time, I, you know, had been very much kind of conditioned to think like the NHS and, and, and work like the NHS um, expects you to work. So this was a really good opportunity to get out of the NHS and actually experience a completely different way of working, a completely different um, approach to work. Um, and it was, again, a fantastic experience because what it allowed me to do was really express my creativity. Um, it was a role where I was given a lot of free reign to go in and be creative and, 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 and help to design systems for the benefit of patients and for the benefit of clinicians. Um, and so I did that for a few years, but then I still had this n niggling itch to kind of, you know, want to push myself out of my comfort zone even more. And at that time, I'd, um, had, had, we'd, we'd just had our first child, um, Sia, who's, who, who, who'd just been born. Um, but I got the opportunity at that time to go and move abroad to Qatar um, to go and work for another um, healthcare software supplier. And I thought this was this was too good an opportunity to pass up. It's something I wanted to do from from you know um, quite early on in my career was go and work abroad and experience um, a different health service, experience a different um, environment of work. Um, to the point where I actually even at the end of my pre reg I even started doing the forms to go and emigrate to Canada to go and work there. But in the end, I got married and that put a hold to all of that. So um, so so we so we we kind of sat down myself and my wife. We had a, had a chat about whether this would be for us or not. Um, and in the end we thought, what the hell, let's just go and do it. Right. It's, um, you know, probably a once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime opportunity to go out there and experience, you know, a, a completely different country and experience a different, um, working environment. And, and so we did it. So yeah, my daughter was five months old when we, when we moved out to Qatar, um, got there for the first two weeks, I was thinking, bloody hell, what have I done? <laughs> I'm in a country I don't know. I've got no family, no friends. It's just the three of us, and um, and it was it was a tough first two weeks to be honest. But as we got settled, as we started to build that friendship group, um, it became, you know, it became it became home, um, and 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 it was such a fantastic experience. And I'm sure we'll get more into it. But um, that really was, you know, the uh, uh, to this point in my career, I'd say probably the highlight, um, being able to go and work abroad and and experience all of that, all of what that has to offer. Um, definitely. I, I love that because you went on an adventure. I love an adventure. Adventure is like one of my, you know, key phrases in life that I live and swear by. I obviously um, have, have worked in the UAE and, um, you know, spontaneously went for love uh, to follow Sanjay and had no idea where I'd be working or, you know, what opportunities were available. But knowing how many hospitals they had, I was like, surely I'm going to get a job. I was obviously very unaware of the market, but it's cool. Part of it was exploring who I am and the opportunities around me and thinking outside the box. And that's where my whole thinking outside the box, maybe personality has started from or stemmed from. And it was an amazing experience. And I know what people are probably thinking, listening to this episode and hearing your journey is that um, I guess before we get into what you did when you got there in terms of work, is that how did you find that opportunity or did that opportunity find you? So it was a, it was a couple of things, really. So the particular company that I went out to work for um, was one which uh, I'd wanted to work for for a long time um, from, you know, getting the exposure I did early on in my career to them. Um, I'd kind of, you know, decided that they would be, you know, a really good opportunity to go and work for them and, uh, uh, and try and experience all of what they had to offer. Um, so that was, that was one part of it. And then the second part was, you know, we, we had always, you know, as a couple, we'd always said that we would want to go and work abroad or live abroad for a little while. So I guess, um, actively looking, um, for opportunities initially in Dubai and the UAE, um, 
also kind of around the region. And then I saw this role pop up and actually applied for a different role. And as I went through the interview process, they, 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 they saw that I'd be a better fit for a different role. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, like many things in my career, it's a lot of it's by happen chance, but, um, but also, you know, you don't kind of, you don't get lucky by, by, by getting lucky. You've got to make your own luck. And that's something, again, I've followed throughout my career is as much as, you know, things have just sort of happened, it's happened because I've, I've made them happen in a way, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, it's, it's, it's manifested in a certain way because of the work I've put in. Yeah. And I think a lot of people need to have awareness of that as well as that you've got to build your own journey. You've got to find your own path. It doesn't always fall into place or you just go with the motions and then you start getting bored. And I think a lot of pharmacy professionals, pharmacists, they kind of get stuck in that rat race a little bit. Um, a lot of community pharmacists that I know have been in community for well over a decade, but in the same type of position. And you constantly feel like you're not progressing. You're not necessarily learning. You're not growing. You're not doing anything different to your standard daily routine. And it can become quite mundane and boring. And you kind of just get trapped in that cycle of that nine to five and serving your community and getting all those prescriptions done, dosset boxes, you know, the medication re reviews that you've got to do and hitting those numbers in terms of targets and to come out of that and finding the headspace to come out of that because you get home and you're quite tired from your day and you might have family commitments, children, and next minute you realize another year has gone by. And that can be a reality for a lot of people. So it's really exciting to know that you stepped out of your comfort zone, that you have been that pharmacist who's looked at other opportunities. And that has obviously stemmed from seeing the NHS and then thinking, okay, I've gained these skills here. Let me look outside the NHS and see what other organizations can bring to me in my professional journey, but also what I can bring to them from the NHS point of view, um, which is really important because I think stepping outside of the NHS and Though my journey, it, it's not chance, obviously I chose to go to the UAE, but I wouldn't have left the NHS if it wasn't for Sanjay. I 100% know that. So having him pop into my life, um, he's a massive part of my journey as a pharmacist and identifying what other skills I have. And you talked a little bit about the reward that you've gained from working on like an EPMA project. So project management, the creativity, the innovation is something that you've really enjoyed. So starting a task and then seeing it through all the way to the end brings you reward. And I discovered that in Abu Dhabi. I did not know that that skill was part of a pharmacist's role. And I definitely had no idea that I had the ability to build a project and see it from start to finish. And the project I'm thinking about in my head is, A, I built a pharmacy. I designed it on a piece of paper using a pencil and a ruler and kind of designed exactly what I wanted it to look like and then pitched it to three companies, looked at budgeting, resources, how long it would take for the project to kind of happen um, saw the project from start to finish. The pharmacy got built and we, we started to use it. And there were no other pharmacists. There were no other management that helped me on that journey. And that, as a band six pharmacist, because that's where I was at when this happened, that's an insane part of my story. That's an incredible opportunity. Working in Formula One was obviously an incredible part of my journey. But in that role, I identified so many problems with the ways that we were working simply because it was a new organization. So emergency services was, you know, still in development and everything was paper based. I was sending out um, medications um, in bags um, to ambulances all over the country. And inside the bag would be a piece of paper which had like par levels, uh, number of paracetamol tablets, number of inhalers or salbutamol nebules, adrenaline whatever it was, was in the bag. And if they hit a low par level, which was logged on that, they would then automatically send that back to pharmacy for refill. That was my kind of work process. However, once it left pharmacy, I'm blind as to where the bag is. 
first of all. That was freaking me out. And I'm blind as to how much usage there is because I don't have electronic data to support when those bags should be returned for refill. And it takes two to three days for them to return. So knowing each ambulance station, how many calls they get, what type of calls they get, what issues they have um, in terms of the demographics of the population and knowing what type of medications to actually support them and the quantities was all done relatively blind. And I, And it was so stressful. I was basically on call 24 hours a day for like over a year. And I would just have the paramedics just call me. And I would literally go into the pharmacy and resupply bags, you know, in the evenings and things, if in emergencies, or ask them to drive to another station to collect spare bags that existed over there in order to keep up with supplies because I was so blind. And we got the funding for an electronic system to allow all of my inventory, all of the stock that goes out of pharmacy, the bags included, um, to then be logged um, electronically on effectively like an iPad. Mm -hmm. So I could see how much usage there was, what patient details they were being used on, like how many tablets they've utilized on their one call. Um, I could look at expiry dates, which was amazing because then it helped me to um, support Uh, supply chain in terms of procurement because some drugs took six nine months to come into the country so we'd have to order so far in advance so it'd prevent me from either running out or wasting a whole bunch of meds and that project took nine months and I was kind of the master planner behind it again no like I no idea what I was truly doing but the excitement of that project and knowing and visualizing what the end goal would look like, similar with an EPMA type mm. role, was so cool. And I had a team of IT experts and um, a couple of paramedics in my group. So though I knew exactly what I wanted pharmacy to look like in terms of inventory usage and what data I needed to collect, um, they obviously were the IT specialists to help me build that. And it was such a cool project. And then training people. The training element was amazing. I traveled all over the country in an ambulance um, with another paramedic. And we smashed out the training for every single member of staff. So they knew how to use the program, when to send bags back, how the PAR levels look, how to enter expiry dates. So when they received all their drugs, they would have to enter in things that were necessary for my data collection. And at click, you know, the click of a button, I had all this information. Um, We had so much less wastage in terms of medications. And I could um, also do purchase orders through the the application, which I had to do manually on paper before. Mm. So I love that you also share that similar excitement for project management. And that has continued in my journey in pharmacy i mean pharmacist diaries is a project in itself and has developed over time um when i was working at guys and st thomas's i at evelina there was a major issue with how we worked in the formulary department and we never had a team um i ended up doing it one day a week but i really didn't like the way that we were working in terms of efficiency so i built asana as a project management tool for our team so that we could then collaborate with multiple other pediatric pharmacists in Southeast London. So everybody had access to the system and could support the development of the Evelina formulary app, which was, again, a collaboration and a project from start to finish was really cool. And, you know, I think that element of pharmacy isn't necessarily advertised as a student. And it's really cool that you're going out to universities to speak to students about digital transformation and what type of roles that you can have. But I wanted to put that spin on it just simply because it's a big part of the enjoyment and a big part of the reward in terms of what you enjoy from your workspace. I guess in terms of Qatar, what what was the role like for you? What was it like working there and the culture differences and the actual job? Tell us about that. Yeah, it was... um... It was eye-opening, to be honest. I mean, again, having worked here in the UK, worked in the NHS, you're kind of conditioned to a certain way of working, aren't you? You're you're kind of you you come to expect a certain certain level of things, and I guess going out there initially kind of feels a bit like the Wild West. Um, you kind of kind of go out there and you th- see you think to yourself, where's the governance? Where's you know where's what are the rules? Um, 
you know, you're working in an environment where you've got expatriates from a variety of different countries, from a variety of different educational backgrounds, to the point where you've got, you know, at least in Qatar, there were three different, I guess, levels of pharmacists. There was your pharmacists from Asia who generally had a B farm degree. You had your pharmacists from the UK and Europe who generally speaking had an M farm degree or a master's of pharmacy. And then you had your pharmacists from the US who had a doctor of pharmacy. Um, and, and usually a lot of the pharmacy schools that were opening up in, in Qatar itself um, were offering um, <laughs> each of those three different types of degrees within that single pharmacy school. So, oh, really? Yeah, there was, you know, different levels of, um, of, of pharmacy degree that were being offered from a single school of pharmacy. That's so, so weird. Yeah, it was really, really interesting. But, um, but I guess it's kind of, um, it was conditioned by the nature of the workforce that you have there. Um, and therefore, as a result, a different hierarchy in terms of the 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 work that those different pharmacists would do. It's almost mm. almost in a way, kind of um, a de facto kind of pharmacist pharmacy technician type relationship where pharmacy technicians will will take on board a certain element of um, ph pharmacy practice, and that is naturally growing now um, within within the pharmacy world here. Um, and then pharmacists were doing a lot more of the clinical work and and, and focusing in on that side of things um, when they were at the D farm or the M farm level. So, um, so it was yeah, it was just a really interesting dynamic that they had there. Um, but yeah, hundred percent, I would I would say that it felt like the Wild West. It felt like you know you, you're looking at it and you're thinking, where's the governance? Um, but I guess that's the beauty of it. You can kind of come in and put your stamp on it. You can put your 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 best practice, your your experience on um, how they're working and what they're doing. Um, the role I had out there was was kind of a bit removed from pharmacy. So I was working kind of on a more general kind of clinical basis. Um, I was a um, what's what was titled a fancy title of physician alignment executive, which effectively meant I was managing the relationship with um, the doctors across um, the public healthcare system uh, within Qatar um, with a view to um, enhancing the digital systems that were in place. Um, now, Qatar was, is a country which probably has something that most modern healthcare systems aspire to, which is a single IT system across their entire country. So whether you're in primary care, secondary care, or tertiary care, they all use exactly the same system, and which means that, it, that they can access um, every bit of information about your healthcare, um, past, present, future, whatever it is that you need to know. So it's all done in one system. So, but what was interesting was, you'd think something like that, you know, would alleviate a lot of the problems that we experience here in the NHS with regards to interoperability and the problems that we have with respect to um, not having access to data when we need it the most. But it just presents different, different problems to you, um, you know, a variety of different problems, whether it's, you know, how you actually document that information in the system to make sure that it's easily communicated across these various different expatriate groups who are working in different ways. So I'll give you an example. Um, the way in which doctors would write a note, um, a clinical note here in the UK will differ very much from the way a US doctor would write a clinical note because they're driven by different things. UK doctors don't have as much, um, as much of a requirement to enter the note in a specific way because they're not paid based off of um, the way in which that they've entered the note. Uh, whereas US doctors are very conditioned to make sure that they've entered the right diagnosis, they've entered the right information. Um, and so what you, what you often get is a disparity in terms of, you know, how the notes are written by one set of doctors versus how the notes are written by another set of doctors. Um, and, and that all has a huge downstream impact when it comes to data and what you can do with the data and, and how you can utilize that to, you know, drive a better healthcare system. So that was one of the major problems that we experienced, but a lot of it was about around standardizing around one single standard, um, ensuring that everything was aligned uh, with the country's national vision. Um, and also um, a big focus was on the Qatar FIFA World Cup. Um, that was a huge kind of focus in terms of their strategy as a, uh, as a country from a, a healthcare perspective, um, making sure that the systems were up and ready and, and working and, and suitable for the, the influx of people that they were going to have coming into the country for that particular tournament. Um, so I'd say it was probably um, one of the most rewarding um, experiences of my career because I was able to help it have a massive influence in the way in which healthcare is delivered digitally um, across the country um, and, and working, working closely with, with really um, different types of people, um, different types of people, people from different backgrounds who 
who really kind of, you know, had different takes and spins on healthcare. And it's something that's kind of stayed with me even in my current career now. So now when when I when I go into the NHS and I'm speaking to clinicians, speaking to pharmacists, speaking to to people about digital systems, um, I do try and um impart that let's think outside the box a bit. Let's 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 think a little bit differently. Cause you know, healthcare is delivered differently wherever you go in the world. There's nothing to say that the NHS does it the best. There's nothing to say that the way we do it here is the best way of doing it. Yes, there are huge elements of what we do that is world class and world leading, but there's huge elements which isn't. And we can learn lessons from other parts of the world. And that's that's one of the key lessons I've taken from my journey in Qatar is, you know, being able to go and look outside the box and look at what other people are doing and try and apply it to the way in which you work has um can have a massive impact on both you personally, but also your healthcare organization as a whole. Um Oh, that brings up so many kind of comments <laughs> because of my journey. And I mean, I'm thinking in my mind, I work with paramedics mostly mm -hmm. and paramedics from all over the world. And boy, are they a competitive profession. When it comes to standardization and looking at the ways of working, from a clinical point of view, we were really strict. So when I first got there, paramedics weren't able to administer any drugs or have access to anything. So it was a case of, working with the medical director to change the law for the country, which we did, which was amazing. And a, a super huge achievement in terms of my career journey. And that was really exciting. And we decided to follow the English pathway because the medical director was from Ireland. So he was very much um, excited and used to using the BNF, for example. So a lot of the dosaging would come from English um, research and data and guidelines as well. And we had paramedics from all over the world and there would always be massive debates about dosing or drug choices. You know, are we qualified in this way and that way? So that, that was quite difficult and it got quite aggressive at times because there would be such big debate over medications being used and how much of it they can use or actually even in terms of control drugs the rules were different the types of drugs they had in their control drugs cupboards were different and the skill that a paramedic had depending on your experience and skill you would be able to have access to those or you wouldn't and the nationality differences and the experiences from different countries played a big part in that and that culture change was quite a shock for me, after leaving the NHS where everything feels like from a governance point of view, it feels safe and known and everything fits into tight little boxes where you conform to what you're told to kind of do. And yes, like we do have innovation and we do think outside the box sometimes, but at the same time, compared to other countries, like you said, UAE was all about hiring professionals from everywhere and using that international experience and expertise and knowledge to build the systems that they had and create them into these amazing, you know, support networks for patients, right? And when I look at the NHS, and I miss the NHS by the entire journey that I was in the UAE, because I think I was looking for security. Mm -hmm. And because you feel so outside your comfort zone in terms of what I was doing, it was completely different to a clinical hospital job. I had no support because I was the only pharmacist in the role and no one understood pharmacy because who would? Um, and, and then not really having much of an external network because you're, you know, you're not meeting lots of pharmacists. And I did try, I went to conferences and all of that. And I eventually did make quite a few friends, but it took years, like it took time to make a pharmacy network. And when you look at NHS and working in a hospital environment, you're with over a hundred potential pharmacists who are clinical, you can rely on, gain information from, ask advice from, get support from, have that mentorship. So that transition as a very early career as pharmacist was quite hard for me. But of course, when you think back at it now, it was such a great learning experience because it helped me to make decisions because I had to. It put me in a really difficult position where I had to find the right pathway for that company and make that right decision or spend the right amount of money or order drugs in a particular way. And it's helped to shape who I am, which is why I encourage people to look outside of their normal 
area of practice or the employer that they're currently working with and step outside of that to gain different types of skills, different type of experience, meet new people, gain that knowledge and then potentially bring it back. Like I brought a lot of my skill back to the NHS and there's no way that I would have gained all of that unless I had worked abroad, which is, I know that you totally resonate with that because it just makes so much sense when you've seen the outside and you look back in, you're like, it makes sense. And it's, you're working with, um, it's, it's not just about who you're working with, it's also the environment that you're working in. Um, it fosters a different level of innovation, a different level of ingenuity that, um, that working in a, a different country, and I'm not even saying specifically in the Middle East, it could be Germany, it could yeah. be France, it could be anywhere, um, that open-mindedness that you have to have to actually make that step to go out to a different country and go and work there then follows you through your career um, as you're working in that country and you're, you're experiencing it. Um, I think it's definitely, definitely something which um, I would recommend to, 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 to any, any pharmacist, anyone really. Um, yeah. It doesn't have to be a pharmacist. It can be anyone who, if you've got the opportunity and you've got the, you know, the, you're in a position to go and work abroad, 100% go and experience it because there's nothing that can set you up better than, than going and being outside of your comfort zone and experiencing something completely different. What were the um, off topic of pharmacy? Mm. What were the highlights of living in Qatar as uh, individually and as a family? Yeah, um, weather. <laughs> I think yeah, as, as we as we as we talk on a grey day here today, um, weather was definitely one of them. Which which obviously had its ups and downs as well. You had scorching summers, which which yeah weren't weren't pleasant with all the the eighty percent humidity at the same time as well. But um, I would say, I actually would say, you know. Being away from family was was difficult, but the friendships I made when I was out there were were and still are some of the strongest friendships I have to this day. Um, because your your friends become your family out there. You've got no one else. Um, we're, we're lucky we've got technology like video calling and things like that. But you know your friends are your family out there, and and you've got, you build such a deep bond with the people that you um, experience that journey with. Um, it's always difficult because it feels like you're constantly saying goodbye to someone when you're in, when you're, when you're away in the Middle East, because, you know, people's, people's journeys are generally, you know, um, you know, quite high turnover of people as, as they kind of go on their journey in the Middle East, um, unless you're lucky and then you end up staying out there for a long time. Um, but yeah, I would say the friendships I built, the weather was definitely really good, but I think also just, um, the fact that I was able to meet and mingle with different nationalities on a deeper level. I mean, we, we have that here in the UK. We've got a really diverse environment in terms of, you know, work and, and, and um, other sides of things. But this just felt different. It was people who were actually from different countries, you know what I mean? And they, you know, you, you learn so much as a human being from being around people in different cultures. Um, for me, the you know, one of the, one of the things I often get when I tell people, um, about, about the fact that I worked in the Middle East is this, this, this instant, oh, that must've been, you know, weird, um, to, to go and work somewhere like that. Um, because there's such a misconception about the people and the culture, but that for me was one of the most beautiful things of being out there was learning the culture and learning, you know, that this, this group of people, this, 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 um, whole diaspora is, is full of, such beautiful culture um and it's there's things within that culture which we can all learn from um and and, and we can all benefit from and and to this day i still bring some of those learnings to to my day-to-day life you know um that feeling of community that you have when you're out there is is something that's unrivaled to be honest um to anything else that i've experienced um it's it really is a beautiful thing um absolutely i mean the community the culture the way lots of people are brought together for family gatherings when you look at Eid. I mean, I, you know, I don't follow from a religious pathway the same way as Emiratis Mm -hmm. do, but they involve you in their culture to help you to understand a lot of the cultural aspects of Ramadan and Eid and all the celebrations. They, they, They want you to be a part of it. And like even in the pharmacy team I worked, it was called the family. Mm-hmm. You know, we were a pharmacy family and all celebrations were done as a team. And it was really important. It was a really big part of the work culture. 
And sometimes I feel like in the NHS, of course, we are a family in terms of the pharmacy team. But at the same time, you are so busy and involved in your day to day life or rushing home because you've got a long commute back to your family or other commitments that you're you're just constantly just going through the motions. And there's not that much time to kind of sit back and think. I feel like I had so much more time there. What What's up with that? I worked 48 hours a week instead of my normal 37 and a half hours in the NHS. I worked way more hours, but I felt like I had a lot more time. And I think, yes, the start of my journey, I didn't have children. So that, obviously, I had loads more time. Um, but Even when I had Liliana, when I was living there, I still felt like the days were slow. I still felt, and I know the sunshine makes a massive difference. The sun is out for so much longer periods of time. So, you know, sunrise and sunset helps to make the day feel longer. But I did have a lot more energy to do stuff, even in the evenings, whether it was meeting with friends. And it never felt like a burden. But now, when I get home from work, I'm like, thank God I'm home and I can relax. And I am completely drained by my day. And it's, a, I haven't quite understood why that's happened. My husband will say it's definitely the sunshine and the energy and just the general quality of life that you live there and the lack of stress in comparison to living in the UK. And he's right. But at the same time, I can't like put my finger on exactly what it is. But for sure, when it, when I look at my, my happiness outside of my workspace. Mentally, I was in such a good place when I lived there. And I left the country because I had a child and I felt very guilty at the time that she wouldn't be able to develop as good a family relationship or bond with our parents and my grandparents at the time because they were still alive that I had when I was growing up. And that played a massive part in me making the transition. And I wasn't quite happy in the workspace. Mm -hmm. I wasn't growing professionally in the way that I expected. And I think I was so conditioned to think about banding and the NHS working away up the scale that I didn't really genuinely appreciate what it is I was experiencing. Because now I talk about my journey like it was a pivotal part of my life. That every day, every experience, every project, every person that I met on the journey helped to mold me to who I am today. I mean, that is amazing, right? But in the moment, sometimes you don't see it and you don't understand it. And it was when I came back and I started working on interview prep Mm -hmm. and I started looking at my journey, writing down all the things I had achieved, the projects I'd worked on. And then when I saw on paper... And I went for interviews. I was like, what? Like, I've done so much in such a short, short space of time. Things I should 100% be proud of that I wasn't during the journey. And returning home has been an amazing experience. We probably wouldn't have found Pharmacist Diaries without it because it stemmed from my work with King's College London and working with students. I might not have found pediatrics because I worked on the neonatal unit here in um, Stoke Mandeville Hospital. So my career has flourished in the way that I've wanted to. I've understood where my values are. I've understood my passions on a really deep level. But I still find living in the UK so much harder and I'm missing the lifestyle and the quality of life I had. And when I think about what kind of quality of life my kids would have now, I'm like, oh man, like not that I made the wrong choice, but I wish I was still there. So I think all of that really resonates with me, to be honest. Um, uh, you know, the, the reasons why I moved back to the UK were multifaceted. Um, the main thing really was that my wife wanted to get back into work. She's a pharmacist as well. Um, and you know, she was struggling with the market out there in terms of pharmacy. We had kind of just ex- exited COVID. Um, she had had a job offer and then that was rescinded because of the pandemic. Um, and then just trying to find the right type of job which fit our, um, our uh, you know, our lifestyle and our work life balance that we wanted was, was just not, you know, arising for her. And she was really kind of at that point where she wanted to get back into work. So that was one of the major reasons. I think also what you mentioned about, you know, 
having the kids growing up around family was a really important point for us as well. We definitely wanted to have the kids exposed to grandparents and parents, um, sorry, grandparents um, and, um, and the wider kind of family, uh, which was something that they were missing out on. Um, so we definitely thought that was an interesting area um, to, to kind of explore and try and really, you know, um, make sure that they were getting that input from, 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 their, from their family. And then for me personally, it was also about um, career progression. Um, I think, you know, as you mentioned, you kind of feel like you can stagnate a little bit when you're, when you're out there. And it's only when you reflect back on it that you realize actually you've achieved a, a hell of a lot in your, your time out there. Um, but for me, what it was, was, you know, realizing that actually, you know, there, there probably wasn't going to be the, the rate of progression that I wanted in my career. I was still quite young um, at that point in my career. So I wanted to make sure that I was pushing myself out of my comfort zone and I'd kind of become quite comfortable in the role I was in. Um, and so it was important for me to look for, um, other opportunities. Um, and then I got the opportunity, thankfully to, to, to move into sales, which was something I hadn't done before. Again, throwing me out of my comfort zone to learn some new skills. Um, and so I thought it was a really good opportunity. So as much as kind of, um, I, don't regret the decision to move back. Um, I still miss my life out there immensely. I miss my friends immensely. Um, and I, I, I don't want to say I won't go back, but, um, because you know, you can never say never, but I think at this point in time, it's still the right decision to be living and working here and, um, and, and enjoying life here now. Um, but that said, I, I do agree. I mean, my mental health out there was, was way better than it was here to be, than it is here, to be honest, because you just have that access to sunlight, to a, a much better work-life balance, uh, being able to, you know, get home from work at three o'clock or four o'clock as it was for me. I used to work seven to three, um, being able to get out onto the beach for an hour, um, sit down, play with the kids and, um, and, and enjoy that time as a family without having to worry about anything else. Whereas here it's kind of, you know, uh, get home six o'clock, um, it's dark, um, <laughs> wake up in the morning, it's dark. Um, and you know, that has a huge impact on you, um, personally and, uh, in terms of your mental health. And, um, I do believe there's something to be said for, you know, um, I guess sun chasing in a way, you know, there's also a consistency as well about living in an area like the Middle East, because the sun rises and sets at the same time each day, every day of the year. Um, whereas here we're kind of, we go through the motions of summer and winter. Um, and I do, I, I do believe that there's some kind of science around kind of having consistency, even in terms of what the sun's doing. Absolutely. Like hundred <laughs> percent there has to be, I don't, I've never looked it up, but there's yeah, got to be. Sure, surely. <laughs> because that definitely made a huge difference to the amount that you could do after yeah. work. And I did shift work, so I finished at different times. But regardless of if it was the afternoon, you know, late shift or if it was the super early morning one, you could always manage your time to it to to fit in the enjoyment while here you find that you are just stuck in the normal kind of like daily nine to five routine, get home, do what you need to do at home, um, household chores and things like that. And actually I think now like having talked about it we were earning a lot more money than we are here so that financial security does impact your mental health because you're not as worried about your income and paying bills and actually we could afford more in terms of help i didn't ever want um, a nanny or support in terms of childcare at home um i was really against it to mm. be honest at the time with my first child because i thought we should be responsible for the upbringing of our children at that time. That was my mindset. And um, I also was a little bit uncomfortable about someone I didn't know, like in my house, um, which is so common and normal in the UAE and here as well in the UK. Um, but there was something that I couldn't quite shift in terms of my mindset to open it up enough to invite someone into my home. Um, but I could afford a cleaner. I didn't have to do hardly any cleaning. I could send my clothes for uh, laundry and dry cleaning if I wanted to in terms of my work clothes. Uh, I could, yeah, afford all of those types of luxuries that I definitely would not be using here in the UK. And I think the time and energy that you put into those activities when they're removed from your life 
you definitely kind of feel the impact in terms of creating more time. And even now, I'm always trying to find strategies to save a little bit of money on some subscription or something I buy for the kids on a regular basis and exchange it for things that will give me more time back. Uh, One of them being which a cleaner this year, 2024, like my goal is to find enough money to get a cleaner because I do all of it myself. And it's great. And it's a nice, like mental cleansing activity, to be fair. Um, When the house is nice and clean, I'm happy. Um, But at the same time, if someone else could do it for me and give me two to three hours a week, I would be a very happy human. Not because I don't like cleaning, but it would give me two to three hours to either be with my kids or go to the gym or work on pharmacist diaries or do this recording. And that's really important to me. Um, So, yeah, it's. I mean. I really, I I do hope that I find an opportunity to go and work abroad again. And it doesn't have to be Dubai, but it does give you a lot in terms of life satisfaction living there, for sure. And if an opportunity came up tomorrow, like, duh, I take it. And I take my family with me. So, you know, having this as part of our conversation today is really valuable, I think, for people to hear you know, take opportunities outside. And I do get a lot of questions about people moving abroad. And even pharmacists who are making that decision to do it and winging it and not having a job once they get there, but asking me, oh, do you have any contacts or do you know any recruitment agencies or what process do I follow? Because I've tried to look online and there's not much available. And I've been back for six years and that is still an issue, which is such a shame. Um, And I would have hoped that things would have changed, but it seems that they haven't transitioned as fast as we would have liked. And actually, that's part of the culture is that things either work really slowly or they work at super speed um, when it comes to implementing things, like, because they've got a lot of money to implement things quickly, which is great. The Wasta, right? (laughs) No, the Wasta, yeah. So, you know, um, I'm really glad that you had the opportunity and it's helped to mold who you are today. Um, What was it like transitioning into life back into the UK? Yeah, a bit like a bit like all of my other kind of career and personal changes is is you know I'm I'm quite I'm the sort of person who in the first kind of um, few weeks of a change I just try and self sabotage <laughs> I try and I try and think about all of the things that you know could potentially go wrong um, with with the change and 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 generally speaking I, I I start to look at you know how do I how do I reverse this decision as quickly as I possibly can. Um, but it's something I recognize about myself and, and, and something I'm working on to, to, to change. Um, and uh, again, yeah, it was similar to moving out to Qatar, moving back was the same. It was kind of, you know, that, that first couple of weeks of getting over, you know, oh, what have I done? Why have I done this? Was it the right decision, et cetera. But, but then kind of transitioning back has been really, really, um, really good we've we've managed to you know come back buy a house um managed to renovate a house in the space of the last kind of six months and that's been a really rewarding journey i wouldn't ever do it again just because i can't be bothered anymore um but um but but it's it's it's, you know moving back has afforded us the opportunity to do that it's not something that you would potentially be able to do in the middle east is go and renovate buy a house and renovate it to, to to how you want it to be um and so, yeah, it's been a really rewarding journey. It's been nice to see the kids growing up around family. It's been nice to see the kids kind of I- interacting with family and, uh, and you know, kind of getting that love, which you wouldn't get from, from other sources, to be honest, um, unless they were visiting on holiday and things like that. So it's been nice to have that um, for them. Um, it's been lovely to see my wife kind of throw herself back into work and 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 really get the satisfaction that that's bringing her and she's doing really well with kind of promotion after promotion so that's that's been really nice to to see her really you know flourishing as well um and 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 from me from a personal perspective I've I would say my skill set's grown immensely as well going into a role which although I was coming back into pharmacy I was still throwing myself out of my comfort zone by going into sales within the pharmacy world Um, something a bit different to what I had experienced previously. Um, and that's helped me to grow immensely as well as a, as a, as an individual, as a professional, it's, it's given me skills, which, um, I, again, didn't know existed inside me. I've had to nurture them and bring them out and somehow, you know, fight against my urges to, 
to to, to suppress those um, those skills. But um, it's been yeah really really beneficial to 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 have moved back. Um, and I think ultimately in my career going forward, it's it's just another um, another stepping stone towards you know um, a brighter future. Really amazing. When you look at because you were outside the pharmacy space in Qatar and then coming home and coming back into mm. the pharmacy space after quite some how many years were you in Qatar? I was there for four years. Oh, so quite yeah, a while. So fair okay. while, yeah. So making that transition, mm. people again, I'm thinking of the perspective of people listening and watching the episode yeah. and what they might be coming up with is that um, how did you sell yourself to get a job in sales? Because A, you weren't doing that necessarily in Qatar and you weren't doing that prior mm -hmm. in the UK. So it's not like a, a simple transition. Do you have any tips or advice or just your experience on how you manage that? Because I think it's really valuable to support people who are watching the episode to see the ins and outs of the transition mm -hmm. and not just hear I did this, I did this, I did yeah, this. 100%. Yeah, which yeah. is cool. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think um, the main thing I would say is something I, I said earlier on, which is you as a pharmacist throughout your career will have picked up a load of skills, a load of um, experiences, which you don't realize are going to stand you in good stead going forward. And it's something I had to lean upon when I was coming back and interviewing for a role here and, and, and looking for a role in a completely different environment. I had to look back at what skills I would be able to impart on the job that I was applying for. Yes, I hadn't done sales before, but we communicate with patients on a daily basis. If you're a clinical pharmacist, you, um, you're, you're constantly kind of, you know, problem solving, which is one of the key elements of sales. You're, you're looking and identifying a problem and you're identifying how that problem can be solved through, you know, the sale of a particular piece of technology or the sale of a particular drug or whatever it may be. Um, ultimately, a lot of jobs, what I find, have those transferable skills, and it's about how you actually start to apply those transferable skills to the role that you're applying for. Um, and so, from my perspective, I'm I'm now selling um, a lot of uh, digital health products related to pharmacy. So I had to lean back on um, the work that I've done as a pharmacist um, over the years. Um, understanding of what pharmacists actually require, um, what pharmacy technicians require, what is the nature of the pharmacy profession moving forward, um, and what are the gaps within within that from a technology perspective, and how can that tech, that, that technology gap be filled? Um, so it's as much about understanding what the gaps are as it is about filling those gaps with with products and technology that you may want to fill um, fill it with. So. Yeah, I would say that would be kind of my main piece of advice is look back at what you've developed over your career and identify the skills which will benefit you in that particular moment in your career because you will have picked up tons of skills throughout your career which you don't even realize are there. But you have to think inwardly to understand what those skills are and what those gaps are that you're trying to fill. I obviously had to do the same thing. I mean, I left... Um the UK. And whilst I was away, I reached out to my old residency manager upon returning to say, this is what I've been doing. Do I apply for a band seven? Or do you think it's possible? In fact, I don't even think I said that. I said, I'm going to apply for a band seven, but I haven't uh, necessarily been in a very clinical specialist role this entire time. Do you think that someone would hire me? And mm. do, would you hire me? because I was probably going to move back and live around my parents until we founded our own place to rent or buy, etc. And I kind of wanted to go into my own comfort zone, which was Oxford at that time. Mm -hmm. So he looked at the experience and he just laughed back in the email and was like, you cannot apply to a band seven. Look what you've done and achieved and experienced and the skill set that you've gained that you would have never gained from the NHS. And there's no way you should apply for a band seven role. And I didn't even think about that. Mm. That's how far deep I was in, I don't even know, not understanding what I was going through in terms of experience and just living in the day to day of getting the job done and doing what I had to do in order to be employed. And that, that really hit hard for me because I was like, oh, okay. Like it gave me a boost to say, okay, you're right. Actually, when I look at, 
what you're saying, I should be applying. And I started looking at job descriptions for 8A roles and applied for a maternity leave position, which I thought would be a slightly easier transition as well to get into a 12 month contract, uh, knowing that I had the flex and it was a part time contract as well, knowing that I would have the flexibility to pick up some clinical skills as a locum. So I did my part time work in Oxford in emergency admissions, which they were super happy to have me. And it was my home in terms of understanding all the systems and did my residency there. Everything was still the same, minus the fact they had Cerna instead of paper charts. And that was easy for me in terms of um, returning home. But then I took on this maternity post in education and training because I did so much of it with paramedics. And I was able to sell those skills and transfer them back into a pharmacy space. And then I started realizing how valuable transferable skills are because I've never needed to really sell myself in that way before because you're always kind of following the standard clinical pharmacist sort of job description and what's expected of a band six, what's Mm -hmm. expected of band seven. And this was really important for me to be able to sell my experience and my knowledge and in a completely non-pharmacy space and come back to the pharmacy world. And it worked. It was easy, actually. A lot of the reflective piece and writing things just things down and answering lots of potential interview questions really helped me to kind of put all of that together. And that skill and having to do that transition and put myself out my comfort zone and not feel so confident as well, like to come back to the NHS, was a really good um, learning experience for me. I guess returning back to the UK, tell us a little bit more about your journey in terms of work and what things are looking like now. Yeah, so I joined Daedalus um, as a principal medicines management specialist. So long title for effectively going out and selling pharmacy solutions, um, medicines management solutions to to hospitals. Um, it's been it's been a really interesting journey, to be honest. It's 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 definitely had its challenges. It's um, naturally, you know. Going and selling yourself to to do a role is is one part of part of the 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 herd the the, the journey. Sorry, um, but actually, then going and doing it is a is a is a completely different challenge. And what you realise is that the NHS um, is in 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 quite dire straits in terms of financial um, viability of 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 the health service. Um, there is a digital health strategy out there, effectively for for the entire NHS, but that's constantly being revised and scaled back due to financial concerns. So, um, so there's a variety of different challenges there that exist when when it comes to going in and kind of you know implementing new solutions into into hospitals. Um, but at the same time, there is a big drive and a big growing understanding of the power of digital to support the NHS and to support the challenges that the NHS has. Um, and that's something that I'm kind of leaning in on to 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 try and kind of you know drive the um the adoption of new technology um because it's it's something that we need it's something that um the health service if you know if i was a patient i would want to see that you know my data is being used in the right way possible to actually get the most out of my treatment um because that's the power that we have all of these different solution systems software whatever it might be ultimately it's designed to capture data which can then ultimately um define a better way of delivering care for your for your patients um and so i think it's been it been a challenge with regards to the market itself and the nhs itself but at the same time personally it's been really rewarding to be able to get involved in um in in designing solutions for um f- for the betterment of, of of the population and also then going out and selling those solutions to to make sure that they're get, getting to the right people at the right time um, that's been definitely one of the most rewarding aspects of the job. Um, and then also being able to work with a variety of different solutions in different areas. So as much as my title talks about medicines management, I've been able to get involved in a variety of different things, whether that's um, software related to clinical trials and, in, in, and, and improving the way in which um, patients are recruited for clinical trials, whether it's um, a new EPR system, which is designed for socialized medicine, whether it's a, a, a wider kind of enterprise resource planning platform, which is designed kind of similar to what you spoke about earlier, where you're, you're doing your purchase orders through it and you're doing, you know, a variety of different um, uh, administrative tasks um, related to pharmacy. 
it's been really, really rewarding to kind of get involved in some of the different things that I haven't been involved in until now within digital health, because it's such a wide field. It's such a huge area. And you actually, you only realize how big digital influence is when you look at it kind of sort of from a helicopter view and you see that there's this data here, this data here, this data here. It's kind of covered covered the entire spectrum of the hospital and it's all kind of doing its own thing, but is any of it communicating with each other? Um, so yeah, it's been, been, been really, really rewarding. Um, for me personally, I've, I've, I've gained a lot of skills. I've learned a lot. I've, um, I've really kind of, you know, um, tried to foster that kind of can do attitude and, and, and really, you know, um, get as much out of it as I possibly can. Cause I don't think ultimately sales is going to be my career path going forward. I'm not a natural salesperson, um, but it definitely is something that you do throughout your life. Um, whether you like it or not, you're always selling. <laughs> that's, that's something that I've learned is over the past kind of two years is you're always selling, whether it's a piece of software or whether it's yourself or whether it's, um, you know, trying to get your kids to eat their dinner, <laughs> you're always selling in some way, shape or form. Um, and, and so you, you know, being able to throw myself into that environment and learn the skills that come with that has been, has been really rewarding. Amazing. Any, um, AI being used in your day-to-day -day job? Um, I, I use a lot of, um, uh, generative AI as part of, you know, the work that I do. Um, so being able to kind of generate, you know, um, the right wording to send out to to customers to 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 make sure that my proposals read well. Um, I use a lot of generative AI, AI to check that, and I think that's a really powerful tool. And I think particularly in the world of um, world of world of healthcare, chatbots and generative AI is 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 something that's going to be hugely important going forward, particularly in the the mental health space. I would say um, it's an area which is obviously of growing concern, mental health care. Um, and, and at the moment often has a lack of funding as well associated with it. And so where I see AI being really powerful is being able to use AI to actually drive, um, interactions with patients to then flag risks, um, of patients who are perhaps at risk of suicide or perhaps at risk of, you know, harming themselves. Um, AI is super powerful in healthcare, but we also have to be really careful and really mindful of the governance that comes along with that. And, and obviously um, the safety aspects of that and who takes responsibility um, for the AI if it goes wrong, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I haven't really used it much in my clinical role or even in my university role, to be fair, but I do use it a lot for pharmacist diaries. Even for summarizing an episode, I can put a transcript of an episode into AI and help it to create show notes. Mm -hmm. And that has been a really good time saver. But also AI generates some really kind of like enticing, engaging and motivational content so that when someone reads it, it is true, everything that's in there, but it's in a really engaging format, which when people read it, they're more likely to hit that download button. And that's not because I want more downloads, but it's because it makes it interesting for you guys as, as listeners or viewers of the podcast. But again, yeah, it's a time saving technique as well, because Otherwise, I would be free typing all of that information. I can also ask it to look at your LinkedIn profile, for example, and help me to summarize your mm -hmm. career history so that if I wanted to create a PDF that outlines your career history, as an example, of something that could support the podcast episode, um, obviously, ChatGPT, and there are actually podcast-specific AI tools that help with this kind of stuff or social media. So. It has been um, really interesting and useful um, to date, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how it transforms um, over the you know 2024 and further. I am also looking forward to seeing how it opens up doors from a clinical point of view for our patients. But there is that element of uh, fear that I have with the governance and the safety part, and ah, bots taking over the world and. You know, well, rightly so. I mean, yeah. I think um, I think with 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 AI, th there's a couple of things I have as to why I'm on the fence with AI. I think first and foremost, within and, and this is specifically within the healthcare sector, the first and foremost for me is, do we have the foundations clinically and operationally to be taking advantage of AI at this point in time? And my answer to that would be probably not. Um, 
AI is driven off of data um, and uh, and ultimately the the data that is being entered into a lot of clinical systems across the NHS, across the health system, not just here but around the world, um, is often fraught with error um, and it's and it's not um, it's it's not done in the right format. Um, so we need to get our foundations correct before we can start to really kind of you know really benefit from what AI has to offer. But once it is kind of once once that foundation is laid, it's not just AI that you benefit from. You benefit from things like population health and being able to you know understand the 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 local population that you're working with um and you can design services around that you can make sure that you've got the right services in the right places down to the down to the level of geography that you you may have small hamlet or small village being offered a particular service because it's very obvious that those the 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 patients in that population are more prone to a specific disease for example um so I think that's something that we need to get right before we start to even really, you know, delve into AI as much as we are already, because it's very easy to run before you can walk. And I think we're still trying to walk in some aspects of, of oh, digital health. <laughs> totally. I mean, I've had fun with it and put in information about myself and it's totally come up with random things that don't, that aren't real. <laughs> um, but it was a good way to test how much I could push it. Yeah in terms of the information it gives. And I do have to be careful in terms of reviewing those show notes to make sure that the information is absolutely accurate. And that obviously takes time. But I do love the creative side of how it shows out on the show notes, which is really cool. And um, I look forward to using it a lot more. So it's, really, it's, it's cool that you, you're in a, in a space where innovation is so important to your day-to-day -day role. And that creativity piece, the project management piece, the problem solving in terms of all the skill set that you're using, you get to use that on a day to day mm -hmm. basis, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, what a fun conversation that we've had and we've gotten to know each other and we have so many similarities in terms of our career pathway. It's actually quite scary. Um, and so many thought processes that we've been through in terms of working abroad, which have been so similar, even though it's completely two completely different countries. Mm -hmm two completely different um, roles as well, um, but similar experiences. So um, I really appreciate the time that you've given me today. I really appreciate the energy that you've given to the people who are watching and listening to this episode. And there's so many good nuggets of information. So, um, you know, yeah, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It's been really great talking to you today. And um, yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think I, I've been sat here talking to you and I'm thinking, you're thinking in exactly the same way that I thought about, you know, the career, the move back home and the move out there and, and all those sorts of things. And I think it's been really nice to kind of share that experience with you. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And um, yeah, I look forward to chatting again soon. Yeah, I mean, how lucky are we that I say this every time I record is I make a new friend <laughs> and I slowly build my network and my community. And it's always nice to have conversations with uh, new people. And we've never met each other before. So, you know, uh, it feels like, you know, we've already kind of made a friendship. So, um, yeah. Thank you again. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. <laughs>